Good afternoon, everybody. And Jen, thank you for putting this together. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining Jen and I and uh, being present. And for those future listeners, it is, and for all of you out there, it's just an honor to have all of you with us. Uh, I think about, Jen, maybe a half a year ago, or whenever I gave this course, not this course, but a course on occlusion, I sat down at my desk and I said, I want to entrap my thinking. And I wrote that, I think one of the handouts that they're going to get, uh, that material was written months ago. Uh, but I was looking forward to the day and the opportunity and uh, uh, the time. It's all about timing of when, to, when this webinar could be put together like it has been and I could present it in the manner I'm going to present it to you. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that. Uh, for that time, I've uh, since the beginning of the year, I've uh, I told the faculty, uh, Jen, that this is a year where we really need to focus on alternation, and uh, it it doesn't get better than what we're going to begin with these three webinars on. And I'm hopeful you'll recognize that, you'll appreciate the uh, material because of your experience both in the clinic and your experience maybe even being a. I know some of you are dentists. Uh, I know some of you listening to this uh, uh, will listen to this again and again. I'm pretty sure of it. Uh, so I want to do the best I can in the hour and a half or so I have. I'm probably going to go over uh, to talk to you a little bit about how I view uh, lateral movement, not through the feet necessarily or through the hips or through the abdominal wall or the two rib cages that we have on each side of our body, uh, but through this thing that's... Uh, imperative, imperative for normal physiological function that precedes everything and thought we do. So with that being said, I, I'm gonna hold this, uh, I'm gonna hold this uh, skull up and um, remind all of us, including me, that this cranium has a very malleable part to it. Yeah, it's right between the pole of this mandible on the right and the pole of the mandible on the left. So if you held up a mandible and you think of what is in between those two poles, that's what I think of when I hold this cranium in my hand. Yeah, it's not a cranium built of occiput or parietal or temporal, or even for that matter, frontal bone. It's built up of paired bones that are all being moved, guided, uh, directed by movement of this bone. And I, uh, I started off my journey in life recognizing that right off the bat. Uh, the leverage of these two sides of our mandible have a significant impact on how we move, how we think, and how we process sense. And hopefully today, this first webinar on lateral truths of considerations or lateral truths of activity, you'll start to appreciate that. And I'm sure many of you already do. Uh, this uh, discussion is gonna be built around some neurology right off, the step, right off the bat, because I don't know how I would begin to even move through this material without that brief discussion. Um, and if you're a lay person that's listening to this, and I'm sure there will be many of you, I think you'll find it helpful, even if you don't understand the long words I'm going to use. Uh, you can Google them. You can look it up. But it's the concepts. Michaela, it's the concepts that mean the most to me. So I, I'm not too worried about questions I might receive at the end of this uh, webinar on what we're trying to do with this discussion of lateral movement that is trusive movement, movement that is giving us a freedom to move our entire body without entrapping or encapsulating joints and sense that we can't get away from. So I look at the midbrain, which is right there between those two poles. I look at that flow which is right there between those two poles. 
as it being sacred. It's a sacred part of our body. And I believe all posture begins there. And I also believe that you don't have to be an osteopath to understand that. Uh, I don't care if you're an orthopedic men, uh, minded individual or a soft tissue minded individual or a optometry minded individual. It doesn't really matter who you are. The reality is all of those things and more has to be formatted by the input that is going on between those two poles. And we're going to touch some of it. And I hope you'll appreciate that as I go through this this afternoon. Now, the title itself is pretty doggone important. And I carefully thought about this title. And if you look at the title in your, in your handout, you'll see the word, uh, you'll see the word mandible. It's in big letters. And the telesize part of this title says temporal rotary movement influences on palatal, occlusal, glossal, and podal, whatever I'm going to talk about. Uh, that's secondary. That's secondary information. There, there's a lot of information here in this uh, handout that you're going to that you might have in front of you that's related to these three words. And I don't want to drop these words off so they're anywhere in this talk. So let's just hit it right now. This is a talk about this cranium as it relates to this bone. So let's just kind of get that in our heads. Uh, if you really want to understand the cranium as an osteopath, you have to appreciate this bone. So this bone, has to do one thing for human dynamics and human control, move. <laughs> it has to move. It moves this bus. It moves, you, it moves you in space. It's responsible for your sense, all of it. Didn't stumble on that, all of your sense. We're gonna touch base here in a few minutes on the importance of having a mandible excite and enlighten your, your maxillary nerve, your sphenopalatine region of your body. Therefore, the word lateral is not a cranial term. The word lateral is a mandibular term. Lateral means you move your body with orientation that was achieved by where you put this bone. I hope that resonates, pardon the pun, because that's what it does do to your body. With all of you. This third word that Jen's circling is what our body gets from this bone for this paired set of bones to understand neural orientation. Where is my palate? Where is my teeth? Where are they at? Where is that occlusion? And where is that tongue supposed to be? And where is it? Even though it's not supposed to be there. And finally, where am I? On the ground that is supporting all of that. None of those things, none of those palatal, occlusal, glossal, and podal things are going to matter if you don't appreciate how you got there. Uh, the growth and development of this bone will tell you whether or not you're going to be a quicker or a slower thinker, a faster or slower mover, someone who's more confident on their feet than not. This bone regulates the tension inside of us, and it regulates all the tension that we need to process that movement and control. So on the back of this uh, white sheet or this board, if you're taking notes and you want to take notes, you don't have to. But if you're listening to this and you don't you don't can see this, I have on the board the three the the title broken up: mandibular, lateral influence, on orientation. I'll repeat it: mandibular. I don't 
when you move your mouth forward, I can promise you the land you're in is moving lateral. You cannot move your mandible perfectly forward. Impossible. And even with regards to the respiratory system, uh, you know, if you're taking a breath of air in versus blowing the air out, I can tell you, I can reassure you that mandible knows the orientation you're going to put your body in when it moves. Our mandibles were meant to protrude. Uh, it's one of our two tests in our institute. Lateral trusion and lateral trusion with protrusion. It was meant to protrude. If it doesn't protrude, your cranium will do it for you. And the cranium's need to go forward with that head is not because you developed or are receiving a patient with a forward head posture. That's impossible. You're working with a patient that has the inability to protrude a mandible through lateral movement on one side or the other. So just keep in mind what I said as a fact. So when you look at that influence of that lateral movement, that mandible, immediately your palate will become oriented towards that move, movement and motion, not later, milliseconds. And I'm gonna to explain to you why through this phenomandibularis region, this, this uh, ganglion and the three layers of nerves that innervate your alveolar tissue of your face, your mouth, your paranasal sinuses, and thus your chest wall. And I'm gonna also remind you that there's no way a dentist can look at an occlusion and get centric if those lateral forces are not balanced, not by a tongue far from it, but by these muscles that are responsible for what's outside that ramus of that mandible and what's inside that ramus of that mandible. And then hopefully we won't run out of time for all the tongue lover, lovers out there, I like to talk a little bit about the orientation of your tongue. Uh, the tongue is the muscle that lays between those two ramuses of your mandible. And it is oriented by the ability or the inability to move that mandible from side to side. Uh, it becomes a really good pterygoid muscle, a real good hyoid muscle a real good temporal muscle when that lateral movement ceases in one or both directions. And finally, how you carry your weight over your feet all depends on when you're, where your brain stem is at. And the brain stem's rotary activities, which is absolutely necessary, depends on frame and orientation that is generating forces of support by lateral trusive function of this thing called a mandible. Now, all that is in your handout, all that I'm gonna go over relatively quickly, just so I can get people to appreciate where this institute's at, what directions it's going, and where it came from. So there's no misconception. This is not a talk about a temporal mandibular joint. And it's definitely not a talk about a mandibular temporal joint. It's a discussion. It's a discussion about the physiology that's required from lateral trusive movement. So I just want to kind of start there right off the bat. Okay, Jen, let's hit on the next slide here. We're gonna take each one of these four areas and I'm gonna give you some, hopefully some nuanced information. Each one of these have a special meaning to me. And uh, this first one does because I've been watching uh, the country and the international community grow around the word palate. For years I might add, and our palate is made up of two maxillas. I, I just marvel at how many people, 
people think the palate is like a, a baseball. Now, you know, the palates take form, they take shape because of this bone articulation, both within the maxilla and around it. Located behind, the nas behind your nasal cavity, the anterior palatine bone art articulates with the maxilla and the posterior palatine bone articulates with the pterygoid process of the sphenoid. So you got this palatine area in our palate, hard palate, soft palate, this palatine area back there in the back of your mouth that's articulating with these things called, you know, maxilla bones and the sphenoid. Now, I know you all know that, but you got two of them. You've got two sides of the sphenoid. You got a greater wing on one side, pterygoid stuff comes off of, and you got two maxillas, primarily for expansion of an airway that you got to have by the age of six weeks, for sure. So when you look at the side, when you look at it from the side and you look at this picture, you'll see this articular side, this articulation side. This is, this is the softer palate. This is the harder palate for those people in the room that uh, are not aware of what a palate looks like for, with a cross section. I just want to point out a couple of things right off the bat. Number one, this is air flow. All of this is full of air. Number two, that is an arch. Like the, if you cut a plane wing right in half, you're looking at a plane in a Boeing airplane cut for flow. And when you put the arches up and down, that wing will change depending upon where you move your two greater wings to land at DFW or someplace else where the runway may be a little longer or shorter. We're constantly monitoring the activity in that area right here for our vestibular system. We don't monitor that activity for our vestibular system down here. So every time you put your hand on a pallet, remind yourself, <laughs> you're inside the wing where you really need to be thinking what's, what turbulence is going over that wing, the top of that palate. Rethink this a little bit. Uh, there's more going on back there as you're going to find out in this, into this uh, webinar than there is below it. And the other thing I want to make sure you're all aware of is that you have this very strong relationship, rare, really strong relationship between the front half of your body and the back half of your body without looking at your body. Because the middle of your body is not the umbilicus or a central tendon. The middle of your body is right there. Right there. There's a front and a back and a side and a side built off of that sphenoid and temporal organization. That is the middle of your body. Your body means nothing to the airflow. It means nothing to how you move your vestibular system through sense of your body. It means everything in terms of what's going on in that mid brain. Uh, thalamus hypothalamus, pons, medulla, mid-brain. Your cranial nerves all recognize that center, not your diaphragm center, your talus center, and anything else you want to talk about if you're an orthopedic-minded person. So I just want to remind you what you're looking at on that handout is you're looking at a system that's regulated by flow. And the regulation begins with your nose. You have a nose to regulate midbrain. In fact, your nose is a septum for the two halves of your body. You don't even know you got two halves without your nose. Every day you look at yourself in the mirror, move your food around your mouth, it is being regulated by mid face. And I think we should talk about that before we go too far in this webinar. So 
That's why I wanted you to see one half of that face. Or cranium, the palatine horizontal plates form the posterior part of the hard palate and the floor of the nasal cavity. And I, Cheryl, I'm gonna go over this probably way too fast for a lot of people out there. Because Jen's saying you only got you know, a day here. I'm joking. But I could easily take a day and talk about all this. So that's why I appreciate her putting together this talk in the last 24 hours for me. So you have something to refer to. You can go back and look it up. You can study it. But this is kind of a big deal. The articulate, th these bones and this, this uh, palate articulates with each other. They have two at the posterior part of the median palatine suture, and more anteriorly with the maxilla at the transverse palatine suture. So this articulation at these sutures all allow you to continuously handle turbulence, barometric pressure changes, podal changes, foot changes, arms that swing one way, and arms that don't do anything on the other side, occlusal issues, auditory issues, et cetera, et cetera. And the next webinar we're gonna talk about for two hours is how lateral, lateral trusive influences on the visual system are much higher than the position your globe is in your orbit when you have an astigmatism. So it's really important for you to understand that this is, articulate activity, articulate activity, communicative activity, heavily sensed activity, not in your glutes, not in your abs, but in your midbrain. When you look at this picture, I want you to, when you look at this picture, I want you to see that articulation spot, these, these uh, places where movement really has to occur. And then I want to talk a little bit more for a few minutes about this palatine foramen, this wonderful thing that's called anxiety, you know, an anxiety killer. You know, why is this, this foramen so important? And I uh, don't, you do not have this in your manual. So I'm going to take a few minutes, Jan, and I'm going to just rewrite, recall, read. And I want you to listen. And I want you to listen to some words that are supported by the rest of the material immediately after the slide. But I just want you to listen. This greater palatine foramen, what Jan is circling, perforates the rear corner of the hard palate and is formed as the alveolar process of the maxilla or the alveolar process of the maxilla that meets the horizontal plane of the palatine bones. This canal transmits the greater palatine vessels in the nerve that goes through it. One of the most important nerves that go through it is called the maxillary nerve, V2. It's one of the three branch, branches or divisions of the trigeminal nerve, the fifth nerve. It compromises the principal functions of sensation from the maxilla, the nasal cavity, the sinuses, and the palate. So your sinuses, your nasal cavity, is all, and your maxilla is all tied to palatal function. If you want to regulate a palate, you cannot do it through palates. Uh, you might, might already find out they got a little beef with that. You can't manipulate a palate with a wire or a finger, or an appliance, if you're not mindful of the sinuses, the nose, and the ears, which really is the neural sense that moves and regulates articulate movement between those two maxillas. The greater palatine nerve is a branch of the pterygoid palatine ganglion. Sometimes I refer to that to, as a sphenopalatine ganglion because I'm a spheno guy. They're the same thing. It carries both general sensory fibers from the maxillary nerve and the parasympathetic fibers from the nerve of the pterygoid canal. Uh, it is often anesthetized for procedures of the mouth 
and maxillary upper teeth by dentists. They know that if they put a little needle there, put a little medication in that thing, hey, you can smile without pain. It is the center, the center of your sensory processing in your cranium. It is how you experience breath, smell, and sense of all the alveolar nerves that your teeth require for operation. The maxillary nerve passes through the foramen rotundum and into the infraorbital canal, where at the pterygopalatine fossa, it branches into this thing called the pterygopalatine ganglion or the sphenopalatine ganglion. Take some time this week, look at it up, look it up. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. This ganglion, right on the other side of that, that foramen that you're looking at right there. The amount of information coming from the other side of that palate will help you sense your toes. We'll tell you whether or not your tinnitus is real. We'll tell you not whether or not the barometric pressure just changed. The nasopalatine nerve or this long sphenopalatine nerve is the nerve of the head. Remember I said that. It is the nerve of the head. If it is the nerve of the head, it is the nerve of your body. It is the nerve of your autonomics. It demands articulate ation. It demands communication from two sides. It demands lateral trusive assistance from a speech center called your voice box and your mandible and your hyoid. It demands that, otherwise you stop. And it's important for you to remember that it supplies the structure of the palate. The palate's structure is formed by that sphenopalatine ganglion maxillary V2 cranial nerve processing, period. And if you work on anything on that mandible and you're not mindful of what's going on there, you're missing the boat. Our nasal septums deviate because of this improper guidance from the mandibular, mandibular lateral trusive force that we all should have. A nose does not become crooked because of the nose or because of a baseball hitting it. Noses usually have septal deviation because of lack of pterygoid function, lack of lateral trusive, bilateral, cooperative free movement. So you can already see for the last 35 years of my life, my tolerance, because I know a lot of people go into ENTs on a regular basis or dentist, and no one's ever really checked. I wonder how well the midbrain is receiving sphenopalatine ganglion information from a foramen and a rotundum that should be alternating and communicating with things that move the palate. And that's what this talk is all about. The first, uh, the, so you hear, here's a better picture of the sphenopalatine ganglion. It's in your manual. Please take a look at it right now because we're gonna talk a little bit more about it. And you got these wonderful chambers in your no nose that feed information to it for airflow under, for airflow uh, sense, filtration sense, expansion sense. Uh, and you also have that in the back of your throat. Please take a look at those yellow things going to the back of your throat. And you have it right on the top of your tongue through the palate. The first branch is the anterior su superior alveolar nerve. And I do think, Jen, this is important to talk about. There's three major branches here. So we can have a healthy discussion about these orientation issues. The anterior superior alveolar nerve travels toward the maxillary sinus and the sensory innervation of the anterior superior alveolar nerve includes the premolars. I even underlined it for you. The canine is the most important bone of sinus regulation based on the nerve that I just gave you. 
the maxillary sinus, and the inferior meatus. I underline my maxillary sinus. Canines keep maxillary sinuses open. And if you don't have canine function, I can tell you they are gonna stay closed. So canines are extremely important for the maxillary nerve, the sphenopalatine ganglion, and your autonomic system. So here's a picture uh, of that maxillary sinus and of canines. I, this is one of the, one of the, I've got about four slides in here that generally make me really giddy. This is one of them. Because all you gotta do is circle that canine, right there, you had it, Jen. And then just remember the word maxillary sinus. There's not a better uh, air compressor in our body than a switch called canines. It does some wonderful things to put some pressure in you. And it can suit, do some very destructive things when you shut it off. We have people walking around with canine awareness only on one side because their sinuses won't let play go through to the other side. They forgot how to move their mandibles. They forgot how to move their head back. They forgot how to shut their tongue off from protruding that mandible forward. They didn't forget. The wiring is doing it, not their memory. And the wiring that we just, we're going over right now is not being received correctly. So this slide is a big slide, followed by this discussion. The second branch of the maxillary nerve is the middle superior alveolar nerve. This middle superior alveolar nerve is totally responsible for providing all of you additional sensory innervation to the sinuses and the maxillary premolar teeth. It says it's, you're, it, you're permitted now to shift over to the other side, uh, to experience flow. The third branch of the maxillary nerve is the posterior superior alveolar nerve. Are you getting a feel how important these alveolar nerves are? Alveolar means space, it means flow. The posterior superior alveolar nerve provides sensory innervation to the cheeks, your abdominal wall, your cheeks, your maxillary sinus and the gingiva associated with it, as well as the upper molar region. Oh, did I say upper molar region? The second most important part of the occlusal system. Because without your molar region, you have no sense of what's going on with your abdominal wall, your cheeks. You have no ability to control pressure, equalize pressure, manage your food, and swallow with symmetrical balance of strength because one molar may not be touching the molar above it or below it correctly through this alveolar third branch. Lisa, for years I've been talking about canines and molars. I have a webinar that I can actually talk about how, how it relates to orientation. That's much more important than whether or not you sense them. How you orient yourself depends on how you expand and decompress at a correct time. So you can swallow, speak, and produce pressurized flow by these three branches that runs your midbrain that allows you to relax so you can parasympathetically react when you're in, under a lot of duress. All of that alveolar nerve and all of their branches from the maxillary nerve provide sensory innervation to the gingiva and the sinuses. And please maybe think about underlying the word sinuses. They're everywhere in your body. You have sinuses in the bone of your temporal bone. You have sinuses in your, your, behind your nose. You have sinuses above your palate. You have sinuses, you have sinuses everywhere in your body. You got two, two big sinus cavities are called lungs. They're everywhere. And where sinuses get trapped, 
is when you have the process of moving from side to side reduced or stopped. And the number one thing that'll keep those sinuses flowing is this movement that's provided by this mandible, which provides collateral sensory innervation through the dental nerve plexus, the occlusal nerve plexus. I forgot the second sentence and it says, these superior alveolar nerves overlap. They overlap in their sensory territory of innervation with each other. They're collaborating. You just don't use one branch. They're all communicating. And when one sinus doesn't work, the entire maxillary system knows it. Your mandible is not that smart. The maxilla is very smart. But to provide the intelligence to the maxilla, you've got to keep the maxilla moving, movement preserved with lateral function through a ramus pole that steers and guides the middle of the head to go this way or this way. And that guidance all starts with where is your temporal bone with relation to the muscle on the inside of your mouth and on the outside of your mouth, which is coming up. So here's the alveolar branches, the superior maxillary nerve and the pterygopalatine ganglion. And I went to, when I went to dental school, I just chewed on this. In fact, I blew these things up and put them on my wall. This is a huge slide. This is where I started the Institute, airflow. And when you look at the alveolar nerves and the plexus, look at them going down to those teeth. Thank you, Jen. And look where they, look where they actually come from and where, look what they supply. You don't even have to know the terminology mid brain, <laughs> mid, right above your airway. And that area right there with the tympanic region, way over here, all of this is innervated by information received here from something that's gliding underneath here that gives you the sensory input on whether or not you should steer because of your lack of good orientation or your over orientation. Our palates, both of them, are moved by the sphenoid bones that connect, that connects the paired bones of the cranium through the palatine bones and by pattern occlusal interferences. Uh, one of my favorite, Harold. Gown. Our cranial relaxation or orientation of the two palates occurs during the transition between lateral shifting of our center of mass of our body through the activity of and sense associated with alternating use of our mouth and its two rows of teeth and the alternation or alternating use of our feet and their associated heels and toes. As physical therapists and athletic trainers and movement specialists, our role is to keep the alternated sense of the lateral shifting and transitioning of our palates alive. I've never looked at the feet like something that I've got to have for abdominal control or pelvic control. Of course I do. But ultimately, the only reason we're doing that is to keep the most important innervation in our midbrain our mid-body alive. Our gliding and shifting and our sashaying and our conspicuous manner of moving sideways, our diagonal or lateral movement of our lower jaw allows our body to move forward without developing postural patterning or forward heads that are chiefly directed by, unfortunately, the savior or the tongue through the anterior teeth pressure provided by the tongue to get you to move in a sagittal plane on a unilateral state of dominance. And I encourage you to go back and re-listen to this. I know I'm going a little fast, but this is really what it's all about. 
shifting, gliding, moving, sliding. And when you say the word frontal plane, be careful. There is no such thing. It's a, it's a oblique plane. It's a conspicuous plane. It depends on what you're pushing, pulling, and that would include yourself. So here's Hannah. She's got this little uh, gizmo in her mouth. And when she moves her mouth to the left, because of her midbrain, because of her palatal activity of sense, because of the orientation of that thing in her mouth on those front teeth, because of her movement from one direction to the other direction, her two terpal bones are automatically shifting all three S bones, sacrum, sphenoid, all this sternal activity by the maxillary complex that is owned by the mandible. That's why it's, the arrow is on the mandible. And that's why the second arrow is on her hips. Because anytime you move your hip, you're only going to do that if you can sashay over there with your mandible. And if you can't sashay over there with your mandible, something's going to break down. Something like an SI joint, an ACL, an a ankle. Our bodies weren't made to work that independently. The number one independent activity of our body, when we go to bed and we become, when we go to bed and when we go, get up in the morning for diurnal and nocturnal activity was given to you by this maker of ours, this God of ours that says, you know what? Just use your mouth, chew some apples, swallow some water, talk to your neighbor and you won't have to worry about this. Because the mandible is the instant feed forward activity that you own for permission to move without over dominance, over regulation, over activity. So freedom is, provided, is there through this thing called alternation, an alternation of palatal sense, occlusal compression and decompression is absolutely necessary for normal biologic and neurologic behavior. That our brain's synaptic resonance and cranial relaxation of paired bones in the head requires for paranasal, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and hypopharynx airflow. I only give this course once a year, this course about that. I think we're gonna, again, one's coming up, isn't it? One coming up, Jen, I hope. Next week. Next week? Next Friday. Uh, in my opinion, <laughs> that slide that demonstrates that sinus cavity, that perinasal sinus cavity, that is directly communicating with a nasopharynx, an oropharynx, and a hypopharynx is huge, provided that you have your mandibles. You got two of them. And if those mandibles are where they're supposed to be, your mid-face, your centric airflow, your relaxation of your tongue will naturally restore palatal discord without anybody having to touch it before you see any human specialist to rearrange it. So when you look at the palate, and I just went over that briefly, Stella. I just went over it briefly, fast, to get you to smile like that. I want to now shift into what really we can do to get your patients to recognize what I just went over without a lot of effort. Eyes closed, eyes open, laying on their side, sitting in a chair, kicking a football, whatever you want to tell me. Now to do that, we got to talk about the orientation that can be provided by a thing called occlusion. Our stomatonathic system, which is how we swallow, speak, and how we move, not boluses of food around, but tissue around boluses of food, 
is a neurologically developed, maintained, and, opera and is operated through heavy forces that are applied to the temporal mandibular joints. That's what they were made for. And the chewing surfaces of the bicuspids and molar teeth. That's what they were made for. You lose some molars and you lose some bicuspids, you are now going to have a dominant pattern of asymmetry. It's the only way you can regulate through heavy forces. Uh, it hurts me joy to see people out there that don't use their teeth when they've got them. And it hurts me to see people out there don't have teeth so they can use them. They're both the same. And they're both a neurological discussion. They're not a occlusal discussion. They're not an orthopedic discussion. And they're not an airway discussion. It's a neurological discussion. It's a neurological discussion for that thalamus that says, I can only operate now with limited sense coming to me from all these areas. My pons is being cheated. My medulla is being cheated. And so, Joy, all my life, you've known me for a while, I will not go anywhere if I know that those forces, those chewing surfaces are missing. It's impossible. It's where I started. And to get chewing surfaces where they're supposed to be, we may have to kick in a little hamstring on one side, a glute on the other side, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because I'm always going after zones of apposition here and zones of apposition here. And the only way you're gonna do that for that midbrain is to provide those three branches of a alveolar sense to open up an airway to move a head back, to allow you to protrude your mandible without a tongue, and to center those two rows of teeth so palates can stay universally an arch. When this force is applied to an object or food that is on the posterior teeth, the mandible is capable of shifting downward and forward to obtain the occlusion and the occlusal relationships that will best complete the desired task of masticatory movement. We grew up without teeth in the beginning until we could do that. And then you got these permanent teeth after you dropped out some deciduous teeth because your body was ready for that. Your midbrain was ready for that. You had two feet. You had this orientation thing go going on with the tongue that no, re no longer required nutrition only through the word suck. So it's really important for you to understand the evolution of all this. And the evolution of all this has one central thing. What do you sense? How do you sense not your teeth? How do you sense how the teeth sense themselves with lateral, trusive movement? The shifting of movement and the shifting of the condyles creates a real desirable, unstable mandibular position for eccentric activity, that's good. It protects both the temporal joints. It leaves your, uh, it leaves your uh, discs right where they're supposed to be. And the temporal articulations with other pair of bones in that head that now don't exceed normal ranges of motion. You're safe. Your teeth are the biggest, safest, safest thing we have in our body to say, that's the end. That's your end range. And when the teeth have that range, legs go to 90. People can squat. You can go upstairs like you went downstairs. You can reach up and with, without losing heels. Teeth are the bumpers of life. They allow you to express and paint. They give you the sole identity of space. As the child develops, the stomatonathic system, the alternation of lateral trues of movement, not only stabilizes forces that are being learned on how to chew food, but also stabilizes the cranial cervical orientation for, for vestibular and visual neural patterned development, and especially the oral es esophageal posture, oral esophageal posture, Lena, as you're yawning, for ventilatory and swallowing development, because that's what it's all about. You're not going to get an airway if you don't know how to swallow or yawn correctly. The postural teeth are your posterior teeth. 
The postural teeth are your posterior teeth. They were designed around a buccal, lateral, trusive, heavy force mentality. Buccal means towards the cheek. Lingual means towards the middle of your mouth. While the anterior teeth are designed through the maxillary lingual neural surfacing and the mandibular glossal lingual perception guidance. So your tongue is smart. When you don't have that lingual buccal relationship, it will push, shove, pull your mandible. And when it's pushing, shoving, thrusting, pulling your mandible, your freedom to move with appropriate neurosensory innervation coming up to that midbrain is impossible. And nothing you put in a mouth to open an airway is going to help that if that freedom of the tongue isn't given first. Lack of posterior balance occlusive force or anterior imbalance guidance can create malocclusions, including open bites and cross bites, as well as hyperhemi genioglosses and hyoglosses activity. Uh, I'm going to tell you a resolution of all this towards the end. So don't, it's not like I don't have a, a way to do this. I do it every day in my life. And it's important for all of you to remind, be, be, be mindful of the fact that I do put things through the dentist. I ask dentists to put things in mouths, not to spread a palate but to help that palate recognize the sense that will keep it symmetrical. And that requires the base, the base of the tongue, not the tongue. Your genioglosses, you got two of them. Your hyoglosses, you got two of them. And when those genioglosses and the hyoglosses become your pterygoids, we got a little bit of a problem. And moving a palate out without the glossal muscle becoming first put in a state of relaxation, you got disharmony on top of dysfunction. And at that point, you will become unilaterally directed by a dominant cortical hemisphere that's truly associated with everything it can do to work on its own, creating a high palate on one side, a low palate on the other side, as you're about to learn. Since our anterior teeth are positioned the farthest from the fulcrum and force vectors applied to the temporal mandibular joints, the amount of force that can be applied to the anterior teeth is less and should be less than which can be applied to the posterior teeth. Our anterior teeth are not meant for load. They're for, meant for guidance, tapping, biting. You know, they're not meant for chewing, grinding. The, this distance enables the anterior teeth, including the canines, to reduce the damaging horizontal forces of eccentric movement in general. However, when per proprioception or perception of balanced occlusion from the bilateral rows, rows of posterior teeth is not experienced, and please remember that, bilateral rows of posterior teeth have to experience when one side's occluded and the other side in the posterior row on the other side is discluded. We were made to walk with our teeth. You have a swing phase. You have a load phase. You don't have a load phase on both sides all the time and you definitely don't have a swing phase all the time called an open bite. Bites will not open and bites will not stay closed if you alternate those phases. And you don't alternate those phases with a tongue. You alternate them with a greater wing, the middle of your head, a sphenoid that's sandwiched between two poles that's regulating a temporal bone that regulates the sphenoid. I hope for anybody listening to this now and in the future, remember this. The mandible's ability to play these drums from side to side is a gift. You weren't told how to do it. The only reason we're listening to each other right now is because you got this far in life by doing it or some form of it. It's called 
chewing. It's called eating. It's called feeding yourself. It's called the digestive system. And if you didn't have the ability to take that food in and take that liquid in, and you didn't have that activity because of it, you would be hearing things. You would be slowly dying. So just the mere fact of moving, walking with our mouth in the masturbatory way we do, preserves the relationship for airflow on top of that palate. So if it's not experienced or is lost as the stomatonathic system and cranial cervical alignment develops, the likelihood of breakdown of teeth somewhere in that anterior or anterior lateral occlusion is probable. When I see anterior lateral teeth or anterior teeth worn down, torn up, I don't really think dentistry because the dentistry didn't have anything to do with it. What had the most to do with it is how you operated that mandible or did not operate that mandible. Since the amount of force that can be applied to the anterior and anterior lateral teeth, and I underlined the word lateral, is less than that which can be applied to the occlusal surface of the posterior rows of teeth, the human tendency to avert force to the anterior lateral teeth during abnormal occlusion of force production increases. Migraines, facial pain, uh, everything from uh, ticks and tremors to dystonia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because of that. This abnormal occlusion reinforces the need to advance the head forward on the thorax and the neck posteriorly on the head, which contributes to the generation of detrimental occlusal force on the anterior lateral teeth. This usually occurs on the left. For people that like to look at PRI material, uh, it, and the science behind it, you're gonna see that occurring on the left more than the right. With left temporal, external, and anterior rotation. And uh, Jen put on there, that's a paper I wrote a while back. And Jen, how do they get that? Where's that at? Uh, it's on the website underneath Ron's faculty page. And I'll show everyone at the end of this webinar as well, um, where that can be found. And that paper really does not cover the material I'm going over today. It's, challenge, it's challenging your thoughts on the considerations of what's behind chewing with an asymmetrical chewing process. The canines are the best neurologic teeth we have to give us cortical sense of horizontal forces on our body that occur during eccentric movements of the mandible. The upper canines and both the upper and lower second molars are the last teeth we shed in the growing mouth for that reason. We don't shed them until we know how to use our body without them. And to use our body without them, we have to make sure we know how to use our body with them. And then when I say the word canines, Yoshi, when I say that word canines, you know I'm thinking about alternate activity. That's lateral polar activity, that's swinging activity, that's rhythmic activity, uh, spiritual activity, uh, pendular activity, teeter-totter activity that keeps me happy with resonance. So when you look at what they provide, those canines provide us a sense of where our pattern occlusion and cranial cervical functional position belongs. You now know you have a center. The pendulum went to the right. The pendulum went to the right. My mandible went to the right. The menti went to the right. It's gonna swing back and hopefully it goes past your center and over to the left. If it doesn't go past your center over to the left, the new center of your body requires you to orient your head so the center now of movement is skewed because you didn't ever get past the center when you look straight ahead because you couldn't take your mandible to the other way because the temporal bones wouldn't allow that fossa polar direction because of the orientation 
of the sense that you developed with the midbrain over time. Now, people lose teeth. They wear them out. And when they wear them out, I know it's because of this lie. They did not have centric relationship established between right lateral trees of movement and left lateral trees of movement that was in the middle of their cranium. Their orientation was off one direction and their teeth and their feet and their palate and their tongue is now got them reorienting the center of their body because the center of the brain says, I got to have excursion to chew and swallow and breathe with both sides being appreciated. And the first thing that you're gonna know is, I can't breathe. If I don't bring my head what? Forward. They provide our sense of where our pattern occlusion and cranial cervical functional position belongs. Just write the word pons next to that. For occlusal support and guidance during growth spurts that usually occur around the age of 12. We are fully baked at the age of 12. At the age of 12, we have what you're gonna be living with, regardless of how good aesthetically your teeth look, your airway looks, you're gonna be living with a disorientation of sensory activity coming from these cranial nerves, these facial nerves, these maxillary nerves, the rest of your life. If you don't somehow help, have someone help you understand the role that your lateral and medial pterygoids, your, your genial glossus and hyoglossus muscles work to provide you normal orientated sense. Lateral trusive sense is perceived through buccal cusp to buccal cusp contact, not lingual cusp to lingual cusp. Without this lateral trusive contact from either canine guidance or premolar and molar buccal cusp guidance, disocclusion of the teeth on the opposite side of the arch of the mouth cannot occur. You are locked up neurologically, resulting in a medial intrusive force that's placed on the non-working side of the oral cavity. Jan, can you help me understand what that means? Oh yeah, that's the other handout that I pointed out at the beginning of this webinar that's on the webinars page for you to download, print off. It's called Lateral Intrusive Considerations from a PRI Perspective. Thanks, Jan. So. Here's a diagram, here's an illustration. Here's a photo of a left mandible buccal cusp, a left mandible, mandibular, left mandibular buccal cusp. This buccal cusp, not, not the lingual cusp, this buccal cusp has a buccal surface. This buccal surface of that mandibular buccal cusp is hitting the maxillary buccal cusp lingual surface. Your midbrain developed your lung and your palatal state of form through that cuspation. It was not developed on the medial trusive disocluded side. It was developed on the lateral trusive contact side which is why so many of our patients generate forces to one side for stability. Locking up a hemispheric activity so they can think, cheat to breathe, and quickly move with speed so they don't fall. That arrow on that mandible should be going that way and that way, depending on which leg you stand on. There's not an arm in the world that doesn't know about that lateral trusive contact. There's not a visual system in the world that does not knew, know about that lateral trusive contact. Anybody with astigmatism that's more than one diopter 
and power knows they do not have balanced lateral trusive contact, which is, will be my second webinar. People have asked me to do another visual course. I don't want to do another visual course. I want to do a visual course as it relates to lateral trusive pons movement. I don't look at eyes. Eyes don't look at me. Nor do you work with people who need eyewear to correct vision. I really hope that this one slide, the second most important slide of this webinar, you really get the wording down. You don't need to be a dentist. Lateral trusive contacts, lateral trusive movement, stopped by maxillary molar lingual surfaces on the mandibular molar buccal surfaces is used for our discussion in our forward locomotor movement courses. Uh, if you don't have it, Yoshi, I will work with a dentist that will help you get it. And at the very end of this webinar, I'm gonna show you how to do that briefly. Been doing it for years. It's not tough, but you gotta collaborate. You have to collaborate with these people that are doing the same thing that you're doing. All of you have one underlying collaborative effort. Move that bus. Move those temporal bones. Move that midbrain from side to side with the only thing that's going to move it. Pterygoids. Not a tongue. Genioglossus muscles. Not a tongue. The genioglossus muscle is the base of the tongue. Lateral trusive movement. There's a little asterisk by this. Jen, I, I said, put an asterisk. This is the sentence of the webinar. Habit. Lateral trusive movement. Stop by mandibular molar buccal surfaces on the maxillary molar lingual surface is our method of chewing. And cranial, cervical, and body lateral shifting for upright postural stabilization. Your glutes cannot provide you that. Your abdominal wall cannot provide you that. They will only provide you that, provided that you have that sense, that occlusal sense. Otherwise, you're going to lose them. If lateral truths of guidance is not provided, provided by the anterior guidance, the cranial system will remain in an inhalation state. Any osteopath will tell you that. And the maxilla will remain internally rotated. When you look at a mouth, you can tell exactly what lung's working and what diaphragm's not by looking at that internal rotation state. The palates will remain high, the mandible will appear retruded, and both the cranium and the maxilla will appear protrude. The second most important bullet in this webinar. If that is true, and I believe it is, the only way you're going to change the direction of that arch of that palate is you have to really appreciate what's going to move the systems and the cranial, the system of the cranium in a trusive manner with guidance provided by two surfaces gently lying on top of each other, gently experiencing what an airplane wing flee, feels when the air goes turbulently around those wings. And if you can't sense that with those teeth, I do know this, you will look for the sense by bringing your teeth together, by bringing your head forward, by using your scalenes, by using your temporalis, by using your masseters to help find the wind beneath your wings. Those wings are looking for wind. And the only way you're going to get them is you have to somehow slide and glide around these surfaces and say, I sense you. I know you're there. I can count on you. I can skim on you. I can run with you. And I can keep my mouth open because my lips can stay apart. My tongue can float. And my teeth know because of previous activity with gliding trusively, laterally, I can move my pawns. I can recenter my baseline and I can definitely 
create an airway. The unfortunate, unfortunately, many of us, many of us, many of you, many of people around us, many clinicians will pursue treatment with a palatal expander. And trust me, I know who those people are and what they're trying to do and the reason behind it before ever considering the role and the function of the pterygoid musculature and its influence on the sphenoid and the maxillas that need to be allowed to externally rotate through lateral pterygoid facilitatory activity. That has to come first because no matter what you do from that point on, the palate knows when it's not there because of the discussion we had up, up to this point in this webinar. This facilitation requires buccal cusp to buccal cusp neurosensory activation of the periodontal ligament proprioception. And Jen, where's that one at? Uh, as it's listed there on the bottom, it's on Ron's faculty page. Um, I'll show you at the end of the webinar. So we're showing you can read more about this. And if it's still confusing, hopefully this webinar will clear things up. The science is there. The schools are there. The collaboration is not there. And when you look at the, those two orientation issues, it leads us into the big one that I'm hearing so much about these days over the last two decades is tongue orientation, glossal orientation. The muscles of your vision, your hearing, your teeth, your face, and your jaw form a delicate network of collaborative movement for independent head or cranial rotation without depending on the neck and the tongue for stabilization. When the orientation of the palate and the teeth is over to one side of the body, the ability to use the muscles of the lateral trusive movers of the mandible or lateral trusive movers of the palates or cranium, i.e. Your, your, your sphenoid, is diminished. A research will tell you electromyographic activity stops. And the first muscle used to restore alternation of the oral cavity now becomes your tongue. We have two tongues. You have a right one and you have a left one. Uh, I want to make sure you know when you talk to me, if anybody ever does talk to me again, you have two tongues. You do not own a tongue. One tongue owns the other tongue if you are an asymmetrical individual. I'll say it again, Alina. One tongue owns the other tongue. If your head can't rotate, it can't laterally flex. Your arms can't flex. Your leg can, can't extend on one side. Your chest wall's flared. One tongue owns the other tongue. When you think of tongue, think of the base of the tongue or the floor of the tongue or the mouth, not the tip of the tongue. The tip of the tongue was, was supposed to be up on the roof of your mouth behind those front teeth, lying there not the tip. The tip of the tongue is going to be up on the top of the roof if one base of that tongue is overactive. So when you look at the floor of the mouth, when you look at the floor, that is what I think of when I think of tongue. That is your tongue. You have two sides of that tongue. Alina, I talked about Lego boards. That's a green Lego board. You build a face off that base. And that base of that tongue regulates a mandible. And the new pterygoid muscles of your mandible become the genioglossus and the hyoglossus and the mylohyoid when you start to lay that mandible to one side and develop the entire ship and house around that tongue. The floor of your tongue is the space between your two mandibles. That floor needs regulation, not that palate, because that floor runs that palate. As the head is rotated to the left, through the left rotation adaptation effort, the right lateral pterygoid assists in maintaining occlusion between the maxillary and mandibular teeth through mandibular movement to the left to match the leftward occlusal location of the maxillary teeth and the rightward direction location of the atlas below it, Skip. So essentially, the top of the head is often rotating to the left as the base of the head 
is positioned to the right by the atlas it sits on because of the postural orientation dominance to the right. And no, nothing, no one in your body knows that better than the base of your tongue. To assist with matching occlusion of the mandible to the maxilla, the protruding tongue will push the lingual surface of the left mandible, teeth, lateral incisors, and anterior cusp teeth towards the left. Over time, this activity will be more likely to create a parafunctional overdevelopment and overuse of one side of the paradextrinsic muscles of the tongue. Now, I can go to the right. There's things that'll move your tongue to the right. They're called hair bone pathology of the cranium, torsions, trauma, uh, maybe even some overcorrection, maybe some early on surgery. The two most likely muscles that compensate for this imbalance of the, man, of the mandibular and maxillary alignment forces are the genioglossus and the hyoglossus. And if you're listening to this and you can't see the slides, you have it in front of you, underline those two muscles. I did it for you, I guess. The genioglossus is a major muscle of the tongue. It protrudes your tongue. Forward neutral protrusion of the tongue occurs when both genioglossus muscles contract at the same time. Hopefully all of you can do that. However, when the genioglossus muscle becomes overactive to steer the head and the mandible as one unit, the posterior teeth lose contact somewhere in the mouth. You're going to have an open bite on, the, on one or both sides of your mouth in the posterior teeth. When I see posterior open bites, I know they're a genio patient. They're a glossal patient. They're not a tongue patient. Their tongue is operating for glossal function. And now one side of their mandible is oriented in an overly sensed state. This V2 and this maxillary and these nerves that go to your teeth, lots of them are feeding up to your midbrain saying, that's your new home. That's where you chair, Cheryl chew. That's where you sleep at night. That's how you raise your finger up. That's how you move your arm. The brain's power is alveolar, nerve, basal, ganglion, thalamus, input from sensory and motor cortexes that should be receiving information from both sides of the maxilla, not one. This overuse of the tongue requires both the tongue and the head to move forward to lock up the neck for better head rotation and lateral power from the base of the tongue or from the genioglossus muscle. The genioglossus muscle is a fan-shaped extrinsic muscle that forms the majority of the body of the tongue. Forms the majority of the body of the tongue. It arises from the mental mental spine of the mandible, and its insertions are the highway bone and the bottom of the tongue. The left genioglossus muscle deviates the tongue toward the opposite side or to the right. Contraction of the right genioglossus muscle deviates the tongue toward the left. Along with the right lateral pterygoid, they team up. But the left genioglossus and the left lateral pterygoid forgot how to move the mandible to the right because the mandible is the, is the form you pour the tongue in. And the tongue is the thing that operates the inside of the mandible. If you could do me a favor and just try saying this, the next time you say the word tongue, don't say mandible, because it's the same. It's the exact same thing. The tongue is your mandible via its base. How can you talk about a tongue without looking at the mandible? Joan is beyond me, beyond me. And how can you talk about a mandible without looking at the genioglossus? It's further beyond me because that tongue has two bases. You're looking at one, with me, Jen? You're looking at one tongue, one here. You got two. Contraction of both the genioglossus stabilizers stabilizes and enlarges the portion of the upper airway that is most vulnerable to collapse. 
Now we're tying it to an airway. Relaxation of this muscle and the genial highway muscles during sleep will promote obstructive sleep apnea if the upper neck and head are in a forward position. When I hear the word apnea, I just wanna know which tongue is active and which tongue is silent because that's sleep apnea. It's not a balanced floor. You're gonna have to twist your head, get your head forward to breathe because the tongue is not regulated. The tongue is regulated by the way it needs to put the mandible for you to breathe. It's got to push that mandible forward on one side or both. Ongoing contraction of only one genial glossus muscle results in inadequate universal airway management, period. Copious research on that. And an adaptative activity from both of the neck and the highways will be needed to be able to breathe. Scalenes love to help out unilaterality of the tongue. I love this picture when I found it on the internet and I love it today because all you gotta do is look at a face that has a head on a base that's rotated to the right with a head that's going to the left through this active, over-engaged, large, hypertrophied, hyoglossus and genioglossus muscle on the right. When you see imbalance like that, you know they cannot breathe. You know that they have to bring a head forward on one side. In this case, the right. You know, therefore, when your mouth is at rest or lined up between the two sides of your head, the tongue should be rested or resting with the anterior upper part of your tongue, gently touching or pressing up on the two palates and not pressing forward on one or both sides of the back of the anterior teeth. The teeth should be slightly apart and your lips should be slightly opened. The reason most of us lower our tongues and press our tongues forward is because of the sides of the mandible or the angle of the mandible, you have two of them, are not oriented correctly by muscles that are responsible for resting balance of the mandible. There are two muscle groups that are responsible for this mandibular position of rest. Your pterygoids and the muscles on the outside of your mandible, the masseters, they balance out the forces on both sides of the mouth and face. When these two sets of pulling muscles are not properly positioned because of over-referencing of teeth on one side of the mouth, the temporalis, the temporalis, the muscle that lies directly above the mandible pulls the mandible off to one side. When you close the angulation of the upward movement of the mandible and the angulation of the downward movement of the temporal bone on the head of the head are skewed then by this temporalis muscle malposition. This malalignment of temporal and mandibular rest demanding demands the tongue or the glossal muscles to direct, stabilize, and manage swallowing, speaking, chewing, and breathing. We recently acquired permission to use this slide. It is the favorite slide of mine of all time. Because this slide is exactly what those previous slides I went over demonstrate. Right in the middle of that ramus, this angle, you have a rectus femoris. You have a vastus medialis oblique and a vastus lateralis to keep that patella tendon lined up. And if that masseter and that medial pterygoid do not oppose each other and you lose the pterygoid ability to move a mandible, that would be lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid, here they are, ability, this temporalis muscle is gonna be skewed. The forces will be off. Your alignment, listen, listen, listen. Your alignment of your patella on your femur is gonna definitely be off when this malalignment is not managed. This malalignment means you've got malalignment on the other side. Your mandible is going one direction, it's not going back to the other direction. That force couple is off. You're gonna have discal issues called TMJ. You're going to have temporalis issues called headaches and migraines and tinnitus. 
You're going to have cognitive processing. Usually on the left side of your face, it's going to get tight. I think anybody who's taken any PRI classes, whether it's been an occlusal course, a cervical course, a cranial course, a four locomotor movement course, or a voice box course, will have to understand the importance of that slide. This webinar is to remind you not how to correct it, but to understand it. Our goal is to keep that ramus, to keep that airplane, keep it working with forces that are generated on both sides of the temporal bone correctly. And you know, as I reflect on what we just gone through in the last hour and a half, I can't make it more clear than that illustration. I can't do a better job than that. And I can tell you the first thing that's gonna erode that alignment of your body when you're on one leg or you're reaching with one arm is that role that the lateral pterygoid and the medial pterygoid are not playing. Because you drop those guys off. Your atlas has a completely different responsibility on one side than the other to reorient, orient, 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 palates, teeth, tongue base, and feet. This picture of the masturbatory muscle sling is what it's all about. You've got a lateral pterygoid, a medial pterygoid, and on this picture, Jen, thank you, a masseter. When you say masseter, I say pterygoid. When you say pterygoid, I say masseter. If you left pterygoid away from masseter or masseter away from pterygoid, say the word temporalis-itis. Say the word knee pain, patellofemoral pain. Say the word TMD pain. Say the word malocclusion, open bite. Say the word high palate, low palate because it's not the palate. It can't be. It's muscle imbalance that created that palate's lack of symmetry. I'm gonna just share this with you because I, I, I try not to get heated, right, Jen? I try not to. But I've taken more ALFs in my, out of mouths in the last 10 years than I've ever asked a dentist to put one in. And I'm just sharing with you, it's not because I'm upset. I work with dentists who work with patients that need ALFs. They're hypermobile. They're destructive to themselves. They're at a point where they need guidance. But over 90% of the patients that I'm working with do not require intraoral appliances to level out that sling. Skip, they need an airway. They need a central, central part of their head called the pons, sitting directly between two atlases. They need ranges of motion that allow their craniums and their heads to swing from side to side. That's a sling. They need these teeth right underneath those masseters to occlude, not here. They need canine references for nerve, alveolar, minded, lateral, rotary function in the entire body. Years ago, when I introduced what a popsicle stick to do, what a popsicle stick could do to your feet you are starting to see the results of this webinar unfold. I tell you, I'm pretty brash. Been around a while. And I know where the industry is going. And it's not like I've got all the answers. But I'm going to pull us back to neuroanatomy 101 when it comes to neurosensory input provided for the forms that you're seeing that are no longer balanced because lack of inappropriate proprioceptive sense through teeth. Teeth that were meant to become your best ally for forward movement of your body without the head going there first. 
our sense of ownership of our body, our ability to freely move our necks, our tongues, and our ability to alternate in general from side to side through our shoulders, hips, and feet are all challenged by deviated mandibles, neurally deviated mandibles for over-referencing of unilateral occlusion at the floor, at the hips, at the thoracic scapular joint, at the OA joint, and at the head. The muscles that keep our postural integrity on the floor we stand on when orientation of the four elements discussed in this webinar is perturbated, challenged, or alternating are the pterygoids. Our pterygoids, our masseters, expect perturbation because it's called chewing. Our pterygoids and our masseters expect kayaking. Our Masters and our pterygoids expect unilateral stance, imbalance, climbing. We weren't made to be stable kinetically. We were made to be unkinetic, dyskinetic, so that we can catch ourselves. And what catches ourselves is this word called lateral trusive force. The medial pterygoid works with that contralateral mylohyoid to allow that excursion of the sphenoid. And there's another picture of the pterygoid model. Posture starts, Susan, there. It's always started there for me. It started there in 1978 and 79 there for me. You dissect a few hundreds of these out in cadaver labs and dental programs that say, you know, prosec, 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 can you do it? I was paid to dissect that bone away so other students could come in and look at my dissection. This is where posture starts because that's a neurological midbrain system. And if you understand that word, posture, then I think you'll appreciate the few minutes I have on this. I will be doing another webinar in the future on that as it relates to, to any of this, that. Do you freeze? There are numerous research articles on the specific correlations associated between malocclusions, foot postural support, and height of the scaphoids, which is your navicular bones of your arch of your feet. Individuals who have a retracted mandible on one side or what appears to be a protruded maxilla on one side will also more than likely commonly have the arch or the navicular raised on, up on the contralateral side and the arch of the foot lowered on the ipsilateral side. Malocclusions of teeth reflect forces produced by overactive unilateral functioning tongues. The tongue moves to the side of the tongue moves to the side of tongue weakness. And the head will move forward more on that side where the genial glasses strength and development are the highest. And that will usually be on the right. The tongue tells you the show. Teeth orientation reflect feet orientation and vice versa because of this pattern tongue function. The following photos all reflect overactivity of the right lateral and medial pterygoid, the right genial glossus, the left master, and the left temporalis muscle. This is a young man with a right foot cross load. And in the right foot cross load, let's tell you that scaphoid, that navicular bone is being pulled up, and that one is being pushed down. You can see this right foot cross load even when he's not loaded. His right foot is turned out. It's not turned out. It's directed by a pons, a midbrain. It's directed by orientation of a podal system. Because on his right side, he's got a cross bite. And that posterior crossbite will prevent that foot from coming back. 
It will prevent his arch from going down on the right side. So someone's got to come into this mouth and say, we need braces, but we first got to get this lack of lateral obtrusive movement eradicated so he doesn't get his headaches that he's got. So he can grow during this time he's in braces. This is my grandson, Elliot. And you can imagine how I felt, Lena, when I see, not his feet, not what we're all looking at in PR, PRI, but what I know is existing is he's got this imbalanced tongue because of imbalance of the tongue. This is no different than that or the previous two pictures. It's by design. It's alveolar. It's airflow. It's a wing on a plane. It's all by design. So you can bat it, your bottom hair follicle. His grandpa put him in something that let his entire system relax. And now he's in braces. Temporal fossa influences on foot interference is a big, there's two little, there's just two paragraphs here. I thought there were only two paragraphs here, four paragraphs here. Anterior rotation of the temporal bone is linked to an ipsilateral inferior cant of the sphenoid. Now I'm going over this, Cheryl, fast. You have it here, you can reference it. This is what our courses in PRI are covering. I'm gonna go over this kind of fast. And superior cant of the maxilla results in a relative loss of vertical facial dimension and an increase in ipsilateral foot pronation. Rothbart does a good job. I'm going to spend, uh, like I said, two hours on this in an upcoming webinar. Al analysis of cranial radiographs demonstrate that both proprioceptive insoles and dental orthotics, which are proprioceptive insoles, change the frontal plane position of the atlas occiput frontal ethmoid and vomer. Their connection and osseous communication with the sphenoid guides and directs the four other pair of bones of the body the parietal cortex, the temporal ear, the zygomatic eye, and the palatine tongue. Regarding podal barometric pressure relationships to dental occlusion, there are significant discoveries regarding the contact surfaces of each. The plantigrade, plantigrade phase and the center of the mass with a prevalence of anterior movement of the center of mass in, the ch in children with angles class two is high, the relationship is high. Class two bites reflect really prominent loss of ZOAs on one side of your body's thorax, depending on where the bite class two is. Jen and I tried years ago to get one of these parametric pressure deals here in the United States. And we couldn't even get them across, we couldn't get them shipped across from Europe. They weren't even allowed. Or Canada. Or can't. They weren't even allowed here. But we should be looking at these pressure plates. And not, not that we have to look at the feet. We should be looking at those pressure plates between those teeth. And that's why we do what we do with contact paper. What do you sense? Where is the sense the highest? Where, where is it non-existent? That's posture. In molar class two patients, an anterior center of mass was predominant and there was a significant correlation, p-value of less than 0 0.001 between malocclusion and foot posture indexes of the left foot, the left foot, and the height of the scaphoid on the right foot. Elliot, my grandson, he's norm, he's normal. Lateral obtrusive anatomy is responsible for these things. And I always use words like frontal plane to help educate people just to kind of join the, uh, the uh, wagon, the bands of wagon going to California to look for gold. This organ trail, this PRI trail. Just to make sure you understand, it's not a frontal plane, but it is a frontal plane. If that means you're gonna join us to fight off you know, Native Americans at a time where nobody understood what's going on around them. We're doing the same thing today. 
we're looking at these forces and we have to get these communities banded up, thinking the same way, join a group, collaborate, collaborate for the word lateral, intrusive, multi-sensory function. Alignment of the pharynx, width of the oral cavity, developmental adaptations of the floor of the mouth, buckle to buckle occlusion, that's so necessary for cortical function. And this stomatoplantar sense of pressure fields of areas of support is all responding to lateral trusive anatomy. Common maladaptation and malocclusal patterns associated with unilateral mandibular hyperactivity are these few. There are a lot more. At least I'm just throwing a few out. These are the common ones. Reverse cervical mid-spines. Loss of normal lordosis of 30 degrees at the cervical spine. Contralateral posterior open bites. You know, we don't develop posterior open bites just because it's in the uh, water you drank or the mom and dad you chose. Genial glossal overdevelopment of dominant hemilateral cortical driven function. Your base of your tongue is so tied into the sensory and motor cortexes of your cranium. The tongue is a huge sensory organ to those cortexes. Big, big. But it's not the tongue. It's what fills the void between the two ramuses of the mandible. It's the base. It's what the hyoid is getting feedback from. It's where your resonance centers are built off of. Asymmetrical facial development and forward head po be behavioral posture is all related to this hyperactivity of unilateral mandibular lateral movement. If I could start an institute, Lisa, if I could start an institute all over again and I knew there was a few people joining my entourage, few people with some spoken wheels and some horses in front of it that pulled us across the Rockies. They were willing to go there because they were looking for a better life, a bilateral mandibular lateral movement. I wouldn't have had to go to this promised land called the left hamstring. I wouldn't have had to go to the right glute max, the left abdominal wall. I wouldn't have had to talk about the inlets and the outlets. I wouldn't even care about what's going on with the neck. Here we are today, and there's a lot of us out there today that want to put a, some completeness, some, some sense to this neurologically. We're doing it with recent seminars and symposiums, and it's all about neurology, as if it just came around today. These horses were pulling neurology a long before I got on this earth. And I just see us going further and further and further away from the tracks made by our, you know, our giants that were ahead of us that said, look how you breathe. Look how you operate yourself from side to side. Look how you alternate. Look at your children. Look at the patterns associated with one thing. Speech, swallowing. And probably the biggest one. Look at how they sense themselves and sense their neutrality so you don't have to make sense of them by doing these PR to I tests that for the majority of the world still aren't even understood. So with that, I just want you to remind yourself, remind yourself that posterior occlusal and torsion are one side of the pterygoid system that's becoming hyperactive is associated with a raised greater wing of the sphenoid and a posterior occlusal crossbite on the side of pterygoid hyperactivity is associated with a lower greater wing sphenoid. You probably should circle that, especially if you took a, a occlusal or a cervical course, because I'm tying that information now to pterygoid activity, which is what I should have done years ago, but it wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered if we didn't understand what led us up to this point where you and your honor and your presence of this material is sitting here listening to this today. 
because our nose, our vestibule, our narrowness of our face, our hemispheric sides of weaknesses, our soft tissue restrictions, and the tremors and the spasticity we have in our bodies are all related to that pterygoid activity. When you see noses and septums that are deviated, think pterygoids. I want to thank all of you for being here this afternoon. And I know it was going to be close to two hours. RJ and Jen reminded me, leave a few minutes for questions. But just, and I'll take as many as we can, right, Jen? But remember, our uh, freedom in this life wasn't, wasn't uh, you know, uh, there because we crossed the Rocky Mountains. Our freedom in our life was because we had mandibles put on us as gifts. And they're as big as any arm you've got, as any leg as you're looking at. They, they provide you the freedom for your oxygen and the speech that your soul needs. And I really thank you for coming and listening to this today. Okay, with that being said, do you have any questions you want me to answer? Um, I'll let people, if, if you have a question, um, please send it to me here now. Um, I'm gonna go through these last couple slides and show you where kind of these supportive documents are. Um, and then we'll answer some of these questions. Um, and so these supportive documents uh, for this webinar can be found on um, Ron's faculty page, um, which I'll just pull it up right here now. Go over to about and click on faculty and see his page. Um, there were several documents that he said referred to this, um, this uh, Benefits of using mandibular versus maxillary appliance, the recommended proprioceptive occlusal orthotics, chewing considerations. So if you're looking for some of those, you can find those on his faculty page. And then again, just a reminder that over here under resources on our webinars page is where you will find the recording will be posted here in the next one to two weeks. Um, but the handouts that Ron just went through uh, PowerPoint handouts in black and white or color, whichever you prefer, as well as this latter obtrusive considerations from a PRI perspective. That's uh, about a four page document, um, which some of these uh, paragraphs were included in this presentation. So just a reminder of where that material can be found. And again, thank you for attending. Stay tuned for parts two and three of this webinar series. Um, it sounds like he would, he's planning to do the vision one, the mandibular, temporal, lateral, rotary movement influences on vision um, next, followed by the mandibular, temporal, lateral, rotary movement influences on the ankle and foot um, as the third part. Um, but I do have a few questions that will have come in, so I'm going to stop this screen share and I will go ahead and ask them here. Um, Joan Hansen asked, what is the best way to stabilize the kiddos who have lost their baby teeth and don't have full dentition yet? Joan, good, good to have you in this uh, webinar. Uh, good question, too. Uh, Joan, did you have a, like a particular age of a child you're thinking about? Why don't you unmute? Yeah, I'm thinking about my scoliosis kids who um, are are just going through that phase where they're they're kind of more uncoordinated and they yeah. and and my dentist can't stabilize them with a with an appliance well because he doesn't have anything to attach it to um so i guess that's what i was thinking was more in relation to scoliosis well in that case if they're under the age let's say they're under the age of 10 are they under is he under or her under the age of 10 he he is yes under the age of six. Oh no no he's uh just for nine. Perfect. But he, so that child has a lot of potential if you can help him understand how to move correctly as mandible when he's on his feet and when he's using his hands. So as you can tell, I can't go over all that right now, but you already know, you saw Hannah. All those pictures of Hannah where she, you don't have to put anything between the teeth, but you can have that individual learn how to move and use plosives, talk. Mm -hmm. uh, express on his right side with his mandible over to the right and his head looking straight ahead. Uh, games, processes. Joan, did you, I hope you got this out of this webinar. The mandible is not part of the head. And if you break up that mandible and get that individual to start using his eyes and his arms, uh, uh, you know, Things that'll make him putting 
a band on one side of his body to get him to shift to that side, you'll see his mandible either go with it or go to the other side. If it's going to the other side, he's developing a curvature of the spine. If it's going to the same side, he's not developing a curvature of the spine. So after this webinar, you got this information, you, years of this, Joan, I know you, you got these feet down there that have to have heels, calcaneuses, arches, shoe, with, shoe boxes that are wide enough for him to splay out while he's learning how to move his arms and his ramuses with that direction of movement in a lateral trusive way. Having him do, getting on a skateboard and have him, you know, slide from side to side. All those kinds of things for his brain to pick up trusive lateral flow without him closing and clenching. Just keep him talking when he does it. Just don't let the mouth come together and don't worry about the tongue because the tongue will be your focus as it is everybody around him because the tongue is eliminating teeth growing. He wants his tongue between him, in him and any space that exists, he's going there with it. But as long as he's talking and his mouth is open and his arms are expressing, is gesturing with the body and the mandible is part of that gesturing, you're doing everything possible. If he gets to the age of 12, you gotta get those dental friends in. And I hope that helped. That was a great Thank pleasure. You. Very and Joan, much so. it's so good to see you here. I'm really glad you're here. Thank you. Okay, um, next question. Um, David Cohen says, um, so who is the first line of defense? Dentist, SLP, osteopath, PT. Let you talk about that. Boy, if I had the answer for that one, Jen. <laughs> David, where are you? Wave your hand so Jen can find you. So not everyone has cameras on. Okay, well, see, David, uh, I, it's a fair question, but my goodness, if I would answer that question, you should, everybody leave. <laughs> I don't have the answer to that one. The first line of defense, though, in my mind, if you want to know the truth, is uh, how well, a first line of defense. I don't know how the old the person you're talking about is, but uh, I just know this pediatric, you know, growth and development thing with Lisa Mangino and you know, you got to be able to swallow. You got to be able to talk. Uh, you have to be able to hear yourself. You know, basic sensory developmental issues always come first. Now, I don't, David, I will tell you this. There is an initiation of a, a, a appropriate, what was the word he used? Not starting point. What was first the word? Line of first line of defense. And every one of you and every one of us and every one of our patients out there have it. Your goal is to figure out where it's at. And here's the first line of defense. What's the first thing you sense? I know people that can do some amazing things on their feet and they don't even know they got them. I know some people that can do some really amazing things with breathing and they don't even know how they did it. So getting someone to appreciate the sense associated with that lateral movement where the mouth and the tongue is not eradicating the sense that you want them to feel. The first, David, thing that's going to take away a dysautonomic individual sense is the mouth. It's not a tool they use for helping them grow. It's a tool they use to stay at the stage of growth they're at. And remember, David, I said that. Now, does that include a speech therapist? Could, doesn't mean it does. Does that include a dentist? Could, doesn't mean it has to. But I do know what it has to have. It has to have the ability to function that hyoid and that mandible when that body is moving from one direction to the other laterally. That I do know. So I know some pretty good uh, postural respiration techniques, manual techniques, that would be my first line of defense if you're confused. Because you're going to see the world of pterygoid activity come back as soon as you get that brachial chain to allow it. And that's all I can answer. Kind of depends on the patient. Alina, you've seen me the last three days work with multiple patients. And our first line of defense is to figure out the patient, their psyche, their behavior, their likenesses, their weaknesses, and what they will probably never do versus what they're willing to do. And if you're not a psychologist, a social behavioralist, you're probably never gonna figure out anyone's first line of defense. And I hope that sort of made sense. 
Um, Dr. Ching has a question. So oh, I'm where is he? Unmute. He's yeah. with Amy, it looks like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey, guys, I miss you. Unmute. Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. Hello, Ron. I, I, just saw, I just saw these people. Was it yesterday or the day before? I don't remember. Two days ago. <laughs> Two days ago. I miss Texas. Can you believe I said that? We miss you. We miss you yeah. too. It's cooler now. <laughs> is it? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Chen is a uh, very unique, very well studied, well versed, well educated. He runs a great show down there with these people on managing teeth. So I'm curious, how'd this go for you guys? Good. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. Good. Excellent. <laughs> so, Rob. Yeah, my question is that, well, during the last few days, you know, we talk about the importance of uh, the neuroplasticity to getting, you know, changing the proprioception so your brain knows what to do and then move on with a definitive treatment. If a patient cannot tolerate a splint for whatever reason, age, cooperation, or gag know, reflex, whatever gag, it might be, DC line, whatever. Yep. Can yep. we think? about uh, getting a, you know, an acrylic crown to get that position and constantly uh, change, you know, uh, with the help of the physiotherapy to achieve that neutrality. Yeah, well, I, I, Dr. Chen, I love you, you know, I love you so much uh, for a lot of reasons, but that was a very good clinical question. This spring, we had the symposium and we passed out these, uh, what were they? Was old popcorn and no this so let me let me we gotta get them to actually use the occlusion and the dentition oh. they have from from side to side chew toy like chew, a, it was a, a chew toy of some infants sort. um teething device teething. well i don't care what their age is yoon what, whatever their age is they got to start actually putting something in their mouth and mm -hmm. sense it that's soft and chew it and then go to the other side, sense it and chew it. And then Amy's gonna get them up and she's gonna have them chew it when they're on one side squatting, they push up, they chew it on the other side, go down and squat. Their mediastinums, Amy, of their back of their thoraxes should allow that system to start registering what it feels like to use pterygoids with masseters. So the central tendon, the temporalis muscle isn't managing that thorax. So I would tell your patient, how many times do you eat a day? Do you eat breakfast? Do you eat lunch? Do you eat dinner? And they say, yes. Let's eat six times a day, small little portions. Let's chew more often during the day and swallow. So breakfast, snack at 10, noon, snack at three, dinner, snack at seven. What I'm trying to get across is they got to keep their masticatory system and their stomatonathic system working in anti-gravitational states. They can't get it at night. You can't, the reason they can't accept it, they don't know what to do with it in their mouth when they lay down. They'll produce saliva, they'll choke. You know what I mean, Yoon? And they'll say, I'm gagging and I can't stand it. It's not a burning mouth syndrome, but it's on the same lines of that. It's overstimulation to nerves that don't have regulation from an autonomic nervous system established yet through lateralized function. So any type of masticatory speech, vocal, lateralized function in an upright state where they're seeing the relationship between the floor underneath of them the floor underneath of them, the base underneath that tongue, the occlusal system underneath the top occlusal system, i.e. mandibular teeth, and the palate that's below this paranasal sinus. Smell will help. Is that a lemon or a cherry? Get different aromas around them. They'll start registering that smell with that same nervous system that's responsible for variability. I could go more, but does that, did that give you some, Amy, did that help? Yeah. Um, what's doc, uh, Dr. Chang, were you talking about like using acrylic implants for people who can't tolerate like uh, uh, oral yeah. devices? 
Yeah, yeah. I was thinking uh, more of an adult patient who comes with a mandibular asymmetry or the typical pattern of a facial asymmetry and, uh, uh, you know, you know, initiating that in sort of a yeah. split, initiating with acrylic because the there patient cannot have, you know, split. Thank, thank you, Jen. Yeah. So now I'm going to answer the question the same way. So you got a, you're ready to do, you're you're ready to do more implants or some work into the mouth, mm -hmm. but the the bone is probably ready, but the sense of the bone is not. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you got to create a creature that says, my bone that that tooth is going to support has to be sensed. My bone has to register the sense of what you're doing with that tooth. Otherwise, you're putting teeth on bones that ha have no significant neurological, pardon the pun, Mune, impact on how they function. Mm -hmm. I would suggest, I would really suggest on a person that you're trying to work with, whatever you're doing inside the mouth to give them teeth, to rearrange their teeth, and if they're that sensitive, is to get the other parts of their body to desensitize that part of their mouth that they're using from a top down for a representation of posture. I would get them to get on, I get on all fours and give them some hand work. I would, it's kind of like that patient we said, you know, a, a guy holding, a gal holding a hammer only sees a nail. Hmm. But get that hammer and put a little, put some brushes on it and have them paint with it, they'll be as confused as you know what. So get them doing different things with their other parts of the body. And the three that I would do, the three parts of the body that would prepare that bone from not being needed by the temporalis muscle to shut down that temporalis muscle and that need to compress, put them on ice skates, roller skates, trampolines, you know, put some, put some gloves on their hand to box, or do some, you know, do some uh, Frisbee work. Just get them off their need because their intolerance is, is because they've replaced all the things I'm talking about more than likely with this foot, this arm, this chest wall, this spine that you're trying to work with and they won't let you. They're oversensitive. They're hypersensitive. And, I, and I've, I've done that. I've seen it. But I, did that help? you better yeah thank you so much yeah. i appreciate that and if you if you still have questions about that let's text back and forth give me a call thank because you i'd like to know more details about exactly what it is you're having who it is that you're working with yes i will do thank you you're welcome hey it's good seeing you again <laughs> yeah. thank you okay thank you um let me okay um there were a couple of people that asked questions about um, what about people who um, are missing molars or they have adontia or yep. hypodontia or patients with dentures? A couple yep. of people asked about that. Uh, again, it's a great question and every case is different. Um, I, uh, I just saw a man this morning. Uh, he has no, he doesn't have his first and second molars on uh, his backside of his mandible because of, uh, you know, disease and, and uh, nice guy. He makes all our glasses here. Lincoln and does all our vision work and uh, uh, put him in some shoes, he knows what to do. Uh, just today, this morning, I modified his uh, inserts. I wish Tom was here to listen to this. And he knows his number one thing he's got to get is he's got to get either a partial made or put implants in his, in his molar region that he's missing those molars on. And he's come to the conclusion that he's found a de doctor that's willing to do that with a partial first. He's probably about 50-ish. Oh, and if that partial works, then he's gonna do implants. So he knows, Joan, he knows he's a duck that has uh, water under him. And unfortunately he can't move his feet because he doesn't own them. And so he's stuck in a stagnant state of mindedness. But the minute I gave him sense of, you know, put a little cotton roll in those voids, he, can't, he was a new man. His, his vision improved. The people in Texas will tell you, uh, you change vision faster than you change gait patterns. They watched me do this. 
So I would, I would say whoever asked that question, the people that are also on that train wagon wanting to know, you do everything possible to work with people, dentists that can help periodontists, that can help those individuals maintain a sense of canine resolution, canine movement, and maintain as much as you possibly can for those forces that need to be generated right in front, right in front of that nasal pharynx, right below the this paranasal concha and maintain that sense of mid brain orientation. And you're, you're gonna be light years ahead of anything else that anyone else would do for that patient. So you, whoever asked it and whoever would ask it in the future, you absolutely do everything humanely and mainly possible to not only one, keep your molars, I didn't say the third molar, keep your molars, and number two, create a sense of recognized support from the molars if you have to do implants or other types of things like partials. Your life will be longer and your life will be better. Now, if you pull all your teeth because you only got a few that are still healthy, you're sometimes better off doing that just because you'll have a more complete two rows of sense and your hands will appreciate it, your carpal tunnels will appreciate it, and so will your edifice. So I could go on and on, every case is a little different, but you kind of got an overview of what I think. Okay, we'll do like two more. Uh, I've been answering some too, um, but uh, Lisa Feynman um, said, what impact, if any, does Taurus palatinus have on lateral obtrusive sense? It doesn't have an impact on the sense, but it has an interference of that sense. Tori always has an interference of sense. Tori is the first indicator wherever it's in your mouth, even the webbing in your mouth, that you do not properly sense the, prop, the use of pterygoid function, period. Anytime you see Tori anywhere in the mouth, especially in the middle of the palate, you know the forces are converging on that mouth. Forces that converge in your body, whether it's eyesight, pectoralis muscles, add whatever you want to talk about. Toruses produce growth. Pressure produces growth. To diverge the system, you need muscles that will expand your system. The best expanders of your system are the pterygoids. And I hope you go back to that favorite illustration we bought or we paid for it's just to show that to you because it's very well draw, drawn out, very well describing what we're dealing with, with tori. You cannot push two sides of the mouth apart for expansion of a palate with dead tori, excuse me, dead te uh, pterygoids. It just doesn't work. Not going to happen. Not going to happen because as soon as that wire comes off, as soon as that homeo block comes off, as soon as that expansion comes off, it's going to be replaced. And the first thing that's going to replace it is a head that's going forward. When heads go forward, bodies come together. When bodies come together, your patency of your airway is now lost. Okay. Um, we'll do two more. Joshua, I. You asked like a question two different ways and I'm not exactly sure how to ask it. So I'll just unmute you, unmute you and you can ask Ron. Uh, hi, hi, Ron. Uh, I'm just wondering how the uh, tensor valley palatini muscle functions in a feedback and feed forward manner in terms of regulating yeah, now I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to be, thank you, Joshua, for a very insightful question. And I'm not doing that to be nice to you. I just like it, but I'm not doing it to be nice to you. Take the, uh, take the, I think it's the cranial course, or is it the occlusal course? What one for what? Tensor Valley Palatini. I think it's in both, honestly. But I, I love talking about that muscle and the, its neighbor. Now, Joshua, that muscle has a major impact on palatine pair bone 
position. And it's the actual muscle that connects the sphenoid to the maxilla, that muscle, tensor valley palatini, because it, it's a tensor muscle that directly attaches to that palatine bone. Palatine bones regulate resonance. Can you remember I said that, Joshua? Regulates resonance. It's like the string on the neck of a guitar. If you tighten the string up, you tense it, your resonance is sharper. People have to tighten their strings up because they're narrow and they're, they want high frequency. We want people to become more expanded. We want you to loosen the string up. And your autonomic nervous system uses that muscle to tense up autonomics. Sometimes inappropriately, we don't need it. And then that's when, that's when you work with these attention deficit issues and people that cannot stop. They're compulsory. The tensor valley palatini is one of the most compulsory orientated minded muscles we have in our body. It narrows the nasal pharynx. It narrows the oral pharynx. Before you even get into the laryngeal pharynx, your problems started above it. So, Joshua, I'm glad you're here. The number one way I would take care of that is make sure resonance is coming from teeth that feel cuspation upon lateral alternation that will then reduce the need for you to over tense yourself for sense of yourself. Joshua, did that make sense? Yes. So what you're saying is that it's both feedback and feed forward in terms of the midbrain of your body has its closest ally right by it called the tensor valley palatine. And if you have to go to that source for automaticity of autoregulation of autonomics without going to the sources that I talked about in this webinar, you're 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 tightening up. Pallets are going to get high on one or both sides. They will go to the side of least resistance. You're now out of tune. And I would encourage you to take probably, I believe it's in the cranial course. I believe it's in the cranial course where I talk about it's in both. It's in both. Okay. There she is. Josh, thanks for joining. Did you learn something? Uh, sorry, I already muted. Okay. Okay. Good. Sorry. One more question. Um, and then we'll wrap it up here. I've been answering some, um, but Tatum said, um, do uh, root canals remove sensation to the teeth? Say, would a root canal on a canine result in the body being unable to find that anterior lateral sense of lateral obtrusive movement? I'm going to unmute Yoon because I think the answer is no. Your root canal is for the is going to maybe desensitize your tooth, but it won't desensitize the bone and the alveolar nerve supply to that bone. But I would love Dr. Chen to unmute and answer that question if you would. Yeah, I think uh, that answer can be better answered by uh, it Peter. By me, yeah, yeah. I just said you have a, you have a, a periodontal ligament. So that, I'm sorry. You have a periodontal ligament. That's where you're. Yeah, purple. Peter. To me, I think we're fine. Yeah, exactly. So the answer is I don't see any problems with root canals right. when it comes to this discussion. Yes. Peter, I didn't know you were there. Good seeing yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Good seeing you. See, Man, you took two days out of your practice this week. You Just guys are a star. You. <laughs> you that? Just for you. <laughs> I love you both. Thank you for the answer. And uh -huh. thank you, everybody. We're going to knock it off there. Alina, keep your smile. Thank you for listening. Jan, give Jan a round of applause. I, you know, I just can't tell you how much I depend on her. Say thank you again, Jan. Absolutely. You guys all have a nice night. Thank you. And um, as several people I answered questions for, we talk a lot more about occlusion and different vertical dimensions, some other questions that came up in our occlusal cervical restoration course. Um, so I know there were a lot of dentists on this webinar. Um, so if you have interest in kind of learning more about a PRI approach. Um, to this, I would recommend that course. Um, you can find information on our website. But otherwise, have a great um, rest of your day. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned. We do not have dates yet.
um, for the next couple webinars that we'll be doing, but we'll announce them as they come up. Um, and we hope that you will be able to join us um, for those as well. But have a great weekend and thanks again for joining us.